Today we're going to talk about Algebra 2, and we've got a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. First, let's talk about multiplying binomials. A binomial may look like this, x plus 3. So then, two binomials being multiplied together may look like this, x plus 3 times x minus 2. Notice how, even though there are two binomials here, they multiply two numbers together to create one number. So what would happen if we were to throw an equals zero at the end of the line? x plus three times x minus two is equal to zero. Well, then this would be two numbers that multiply together to equal zero, x plus three as one and x minus two as the other. But what do we know about multiplying two numbers together and ending up with zero? Well, at least one of the two numbers must be equal to zero. So now, both of these equations are possible answers, leading to two solutions for x. x equals negative three and x equals two. Two binomials multiplied together also assist in introducing an abbreviation that's surprisingly helpful, FOIL, or F-O-I-L. FOIL stands for first, outside, inside, last, and refers to the four multiplications that occur when multiplying binomials. As an example, x plus three times x minus two is x times x, which is x squared, plus x times negative two, which is negative two x, plus three times x, which is three x, plus three times negative two, which is negative six. This gives us, when simplified. Notice that this end result is a trinomial. That means that in some cases, we can start with a trinomial set equal to zero and do the inverse of foiling in order to get two binomials multiplied together equal to zero. For example, if x squared plus 8x plus 12 is equal to zero, then we can set up a puzzle to find which two binomials this is as follows. First, we place the x's in the first position since x squared is just two x's multiplied together. Then we fill in the other two spots by answering the following question. Which two numbers that add to eight multiply to be 12? This works this way because the term with x is eight and the constant term is 12. The outside and inside terms make up the term with x and the last terms make up the constant term. Which two numbers add to eight that also multiply to 12? Well, we can do this by listing all the pairs of factors of 12 and we conclude that the numbers are six and two. And so, so, so x equals negative two and x equals negative six are the two solutions to this expression. Next, let's talk about rules of exponents. Exponents represent how many times a number is multiplied by itself. So for example, five to the power of three means five times five times five is equal to 125. So then any number to the power of one is just itself. As an example, eight to the power of one is equal to eight. So then important question, what's four to the power of zero? The naive answer would be zero, but it's actually one. Why? Well, one is the multiplicative identity. It's the only number that you can multiply by anything to not change its value. So to multiply by no more fours is kind of like multiplying by nothing. Not multiplying by zero, but multiplying by nothing. That is not multiplying by something better known as doing nothing at all. Another rule of exponents states that a to the power of b times a to the power of c is equal to a to the power of b plus c. In everyday terms, this means that multiplying something by itself a set number of times and then multiplying by itself another set number of times is like multiplying by itself the sum of those two numbers of times. For example, four to the power of three times four to the power of two is equal to four to the power of three plus two, which is equal to four to the power of five. We can also use this rule to prove that if a is not equal to zero, then a to the power of zero is equal to one as follows. So therefore, we have that what we started with is equal to what we started with multiplied by four to the power of zero. This would only work if four to the power of zero were, were equal to one, which is the multiplicative identity. Now that we know about powers, let's address square roots and radicals. The square root of a number, let's say 16, is defined as the number that, when multiplied by itself, is 16. So then, what number multiplied by itself is 16? Yes, four, very good. But remember something, if you multiply two negative numbers together, you get a positive number. So the answer is also negative four, since negative four multiplied by itself is 16. We'll get into the repercussions of square roots in just a bit, but there's more than just square roots. If you were to write this, this would imply the square root of 16. But if you put a number in this spot, this implies that the power is different. If we put a four there, that means the fourth root of 16, which asks what number, when multiplied by itself four times, is 16. That number, as it turns out, is two. 
so the fourth root of 16 is 2. Furthermore, you can just write the nth root of a number as a to the power of 1 divided by n. This allows us to conclude things like the third root of 10 times the third root of 100 is equal to the third root of 10 times the third root of 10 squared, which means the following. So we just get 10. Yay! With radicals concluded, we now look at inverse operations. The concept of inverse operations are that they're operations that undo one another. These have real life analogs such as taking one step left and one step right. When it comes to individual operations, these are relatively easy to figure out. f of x equals x plus 4, so the inverse of f of x is equal to x minus 4. Note that this is not f to the power of negative 1, but rather the candidate inverse function of f. So. How can we do this with more complex expressions like f of x equals 3x plus 5? Here's what we do. Since the inverse function does to x as x does to the function, then we can replace f of x with x and the original x's with f inverse of x giving us, we then isolate the inverse function candidate as follows. Notice that I called it an inverse function candidate. This is because it's not necessarily the inverse function unless the function of the inverse function is equal to the inverse function of the function of x, which is equal to x. Another way of saying this expression is that doing the function and then the inverse function of what you start with, or doing the inverse function of the function of what you start with must equal what you start with. This comes full circle back to exponents. Remember how I said that square roots include two results, the positive and negative result? This means that the graph depicting square roots doesn't pass a vertical line test since there exist inputs that give more than one output. This is an example where the candidate for the square function, the square root function, is actually not a function at all, and so it can't be the inverse function. Coincidentally enough, this doesn't work for any even power, and it works properly for any odd power. Thank you all for watching, and GLHF.